see the screen, it's a, it's a little bit dodgy, I know. I was looking at the, the, the last presentation and you couldn't see much. But uh, I really wanted to ask the CV of my kind of flash out there. I don't really know that. I wanted to kind of just check the room, really, and so make it more like a workshop than a presentation, in the sense that uh, if you can answer this question, for example, would you say that you are a member of the animal rights movement or would you say that you're not a member of the animal rights movement? Who would say they are a member of the animal rights movement? Would anybody say no to that question? Okay, is there a reason? Okay, and one at the back? I'm giving a great deal of thought. I don't know. I'm just here relaxed and listening to what you've got to say. Okay, right. <laughs> okay, well, I'll relax as well. <laughs> so, similar question then. Who would describe himself as an animal rightist? It might sound like a more technical question. Would, would anybody say, I'm an animal rightist? What do you mean by that? Uh, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I, just, I just want to. Check the room. Could you define it? Uh, well, well, we'll come on to that. Uh, Tom Reagan. How many people in the room have read the book, The Case for Animal Rights? Okay. Anybody read any other book by Tom Reagan? Professor Tom Reagan. Maybe like Empty Cages, In Defense of Animals? In defense of animal rights, that kind of thing, defending animal rights. Is there anybody in the room who would feel confident discussing and describing his concept of subject of a life? Anybody familiar with the work of Joan Denea? Okay. So anybody read Animal Equality? which is mainly about language, subtitle, language integration, and a more well-known book is called Speciesism. How many people have read Speciesism? Okay. It's the same hands going up all the time. <laughs> Gary Lawrence Francio. Animals, Property and the Law. Anyone read that? Rain Without Thunder. An introduction to normal rights. What is it? Uh, your child or the dog? Okay. Now, Francio uses the work of someone called Henry Shu, and he talks about basic rights. Does anybody familiar with that and how Francio uses it? Okay. If you were talking to people on the street or anywhere else, which of the, these kind of phrases would you use? Would you use the phrase cruelty to animals a lot? Or would you talk about rights violations a lot? Who would talk about cruelty to animals more than rights violations? Who would talk about rights violations more than cruelty to animals? Same hands going up. <laughs> now, you might not be able to read this. This says legal rights moral rights, positive rights, and negative rights. In the context of animal rights, would we be comfortable talking about these things? Would, for example, people know the difference between moral and legal rights, and what that means in terms of animal rights theory? If anybody understands that distinction, you put your hands up. Okay, and in relation to animal rights, the notion of positive rights and negative rights. Okay. Peter Singer. How many people in this room have read his book, Animal Liberation? Okay. Now, I asked that question ten years ago and a lot of hands would go up, which is quite an interesting thing. Would anybody be comfortable in explaining why animal liberation 
is not an animal rights book. Would anybody feel comfortable about explaining why animal liberation is not an animal rights book? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody be able to explain why Peter Singer rejects rights? Human rights or animal rights? Uh, it could be, you know, any of the mark that I I think Peter Singer believes that animals, um, we should have absolutely no influence on the world, so that animal rights is a man-made thing, and animals are outside of that. Um, okay. I would, I would say that the reason he reacts rights is he's a utilitarian philosopher. Okay, he's not a rights-based philosopher. Okay, so I'll just go back a little bit then. Most people in the movement either reject rights or they're not well versed in rights and they tend not to frame their claims making in terms of rights. Now, Whenever I've complained about this in the past, people say, what's the problem? The movement seems to be doing pretty well. Now, the reason it's a problem, from my point of view, is that there are some people, a minority, admittedly, who actually want to base their claims about animal rights on rights-based philosophy. And that means that the rest of the movement, in a sense, is kind of getting in their way. Because it's very difficult to talk about animal rights when people don't know what you're talking about. And also, most people think that the founder of animal rights <laughs> is Peter Singer, who doesn't believe in rights. Peter Singer has complained bitterly about being called an animal rights philosopher. He regrets using the term in animal liberation. And so right from the 1970s, he's complained about it. He's mainly complained about it within the academic world. He tends not to complain about it too much within the movement. Very much on the grounds, really, that I think he knows the reality, which is that most people are not that bothered about the distinction. It's the rights-based people who are bothered about it because they're the ones who are as it were, think of rights as a precious thing in terms of the foundation of their claims about our relationships with other animals. So when we talk about rights in the animal rights movement, we tend to do it as a rhetorical thing. It's an empty thing. It's without philosophical substance. It's just a label. People like the label. Often people like the label because it's seen as an alternative to welfare. People tend not to think of themselves as animal welfare so much because that's not rad enough. You know, it's people who self-identify as radical people tend not to want to be associated with maybe the RSPCA or the HSUS in North America. They prefer the name animal rights. It sounds a bit more edgy. At the same time, they don't take any time to look for the philosophy and often it's worse than that, they look at the philosophy, but then they reject it. Because the rights-based philosophy can be seen as something more difficult than just talking about cruelty to animals. The ironic thing about that is that when you talk about cruelty to animals, you're straight into the welfareist paradigm. Because you're talking about not being cruel. And that is the cornerstone of animal welfareism, that non-cruel use is possible and feasible. Now we probably think, a lot of us probably think that's not true. But the promise of animal welfare is for a non-cruel type of use. And so if we clear out the bad apples in the slaughterhouses and if we sharpen up here and we reform there, we'll get this promise of non-cruel use. The cornerstone concept of animal welfareism is unnecessary suffering is based on the idea that some suffering is necessary but you can do all this you can use them without being cruel okay so when we talk about cruelty to animals whether we kind of know it or not 
we tap straight into the mainstream welfareist paradigm. We don't shift the paradigm. Animal rights talk does. Because what animal rights talk does is say that other animals, we believe, are the bearers of rights. They are rights holders. Now, Tom Reagan says it's because they're subject of life. Francione Denea would say because they are sentient beings. But when they're rights holders and rights bearers, it means what we do to them is not just cruel. What we do to them are rights violations. And people say, yeah, but that's not really good in a movement. You can't sell that. My response to that is I don't think anybody has any problem with the notion of rights violations when it comes to human beings, for example. People talk about human rights violations all the time. Organizations that stand for human rights talk about rights violations all the time. The organizations that suggest they stand for animal rights hardly ever, if ever, mention it. You go back, have a look at the animal rights movement, you try and find any leaflets or anything substantive which talks about animal rights violations. It's few and far between. Our language is not the language of animal rights. Our label is animal rights. That's all. Okay. The people who want animal rights movement are the ones who are saying to people, let's try to shift this. If you're not familiar with animal rights philosophy, then make yourself familiar with it, see what it's like, see if you dig it, and if you do, go for it. If you don't like it, fair enough, there's other things, there's lots of other claims, but the best thing to do in that relationship is not call yourself animal rights. If you don't believe in animal rights, then don't call yourself animal rights. The, the rights-based people have got a paradox here that they're trying to talk to a movement who have their name but none of their beliefs. It's very difficult to have a conversation because you say, yeah, but rights is the center, the foundation of our claims making. And you're saying that to a group of people who just use it as a label, as an empty rhetorical label. It's just, just a label. So positive and Negative rights. Now, this is an interesting one because this is uh, one way that we can talk about our rights in a great way that the public get. In the sense that, um, you know, we've always had that thing, oh, well, you know, you want uh, education for cows and ballet lessons for pigs and all this kind of stuff and, you know, the, the right to that kind of thing. And rights, of course, are particularly controversial in North America. You know, children's rights are a controversial idea in, in North America. But if you educate yourself in relation to positive and negative rights, then it's quite easily um, talked about. Negative rights are basic rights, back to shoe. So our basic rights are the founding blocks of our non-basic rights, or our negative rights are the founding blocks of our positive rights. The way that I express this in my own work was to say that some of our rights are our animal rights. Some of our rights are our animal rights. The rights that we logically share with other animals. We are animals, we're mammals, we're apes. We share some rights with our non-human kin. Because negative rights is about things we don't want done to us. We don't want to be tortured. We don't want anyone to kill us. We don't want to suffer, etc. We share that with others. That's not just a human thing. On top of those negative rights, we can build positive human rights. The right to education, the right to drive, whatever you want to say. That those rights that are not relevant to other animals. They are human rights. They are only relevant to us until you know, things change. Evolution, robots come into it. That's going to complicate things. But. Negative rights is a really easy way of talking to the public about animal rights because no one wants to be tortured. But they know that their dog doesn't want to be tortured. They know that it's not hard. 
You know, people tell me you can't explain Amorites, it's too complicated. It's not. It's not at all. So just going back to one of my last, uh, what's that one there? Stay, 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 stay boy. There. So what's in the name? This slide says, what's in the name? Because people have always said that to me. When I've made this case, people have said, what's the problem? What's in the name? In the name is very important because social movements, I mean, I'm a sociologist, social, sociologists see social movements as claims makers in society. We make claims. We identify problems and we make claims about them. Think about the feminist movement. Everything was going swimmingly for men and then along came these uppity feminists and said, hang on a minute, there's a problem and we're going to make some claims about it. And one of the things they did to start altering the, the language, you know, history became his story and everything else. So that's what social movements do. We are a social movement. We make claims. We say that there's a problem with the way that we use other animals. This is a problem. Now we know that for most people out there it's not. They don't think about it. It's not an issue for them. For us it's a problem. That's our claim. Okay? Another one of our claims is that other animals, like us, have rights. We could say that. And so it's the people who are rights-based that want to say that. So in terms of our rights, who within the movement should be known as animal rights people? Should it be people who don't really care about rights or don't really know about rights? Or should it be those who are actively opposed to animal rights, like Peter Singer? Or should it instead, this is kind of, if you like, my plea, should it be those who generally want to put rights at the heart of their position about our relationships with other animals and each other? You know, it's, it's a very simple thing, I think. And yet, I, for years, have met a brick wall on this. Most people are not interested in rights except for the name. And when you then try to say, well, that in itself is a problem, they tend not to see it. I think there might be another one. Ah, right. This is just one of our VIP posters, which says, the concept of rights is a huge threat to a system built entirely on rights violations. And we have that displayed in Dublin every week. We can talk about rights. We talk about veganism, obviously. Uh, it's not an issue. My plea today is that there are people, and I've, for a few years now, I've used the phrase, rights-based animal rights. I shouldn't have to use that phrase. I've had to use that phrase to differentiate me from the people who are non-rights-based animal rights. In other words, rights is a convenient label that I like, but I don't like or don't know the philosophy. I say that if you're interested in animal rights, recognize that it's a philosophy, there are books about it, there's a position about it, it's easy to explain, but also it's something that is aspirational in terms of wanting to become a movement. And it doesn't help. North Americans tell me, Antony Nocella, they tell me one of the first things that they get is, are you a member of PETA? When they talk about Amorant, are you a member of PETA? Now, this is just mind-blowing. If anybody knows anything about rights, you know that you couldn't be a member of PETA. PETA have got nothing to do with rights. They believe that you can trample all over women's rights to get animal rights. You know, they've got nothing to do with rights. You know, it's the fact that we have such an unsophisticated grasp of what we're talking about with rights that even allows that question to be asked. You know, Peter got nothing to do with rights. I mean, my own position, as you probably well know, I think they should be shut down tomorrow. But you know, nothing to do with rights. They're sexist. They're racist. They can't have anything to do with rights. They can't have anything to do with, with veganism. They're not a justice organization. Veganism is a justice movement. Justice for all. Peter are white out of it. 
it, they don't figure, and they shouldn't. You should be closed down immediately. If we took right seriously, we'd get rid of crap like Peter, and we'd get on with the proper job of educating people about animal rights. Proper animal rights. Cheers.